in this episode of the Critical Oxygen Podcast. The aerobic portion of training is is kind of boring. The key here to keep yourself entertained, at least you know, uh, from from a biking perspective, is variation. You can vary your cadence. You can vary your elevation. You can vary your power. Um, you can switch from erg mode to resistance mode, depending on you know the type of software that you're using. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Critical Oxygen Podcast, where we help you optimize your physiology and maximize your athletic potential. I'm your host, Phil Batterson, and today we're joined by continuing guest host, Coach Aaron Geyser, where we're going to talk about how to make indoor training fun. Aaron, welcome back to the show. How's it going today? Good, man. Good. It's always it's always fun to have. We, we have these conversations pretty much every Friday, so I, I it's it's a sign that the weekend is over or the week is over and it's time to, you know, start relaxing. Um, so, so <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just like, it's a, it's a good, it's a good point in my week. Right. It means that, you know, like I get to, I get to have a good conversation with Aaron, wind down the week. You know, it's, it's the way that I like to spend it, have good conversation with friends. That's my point. Aaron's I'll like, I'm offend I'm offended, dude. You just told me. No, that no, this no. Is <laughs> no, it's, it's the fact of downtime. I don't know what the heck that is, man. I'm, oh, always, trying yeah. to fit, I'm always trying to fit 25 minutes of work into 20 minute timeline. Yeah. And it's just like downtime. What the heck are you talking yeah, you're, about? Yeah. Like, no, 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 no. That's recovery. That's not a thing. Um, but <laughs> I mean, no. So, so from the perspective of, you know, indoor training and stuff like that, right. You know, I think a lot of people do feel like there isn't very much downtime, especially in the off season. Um, and this is something you and I have, have kind of been talking about on and off again for a while is like, and you, you said it, you said it earlier. You're like, yeah, indoor training is boring. Like, oh, you know, <laughs> Let me, I don't even think indoor training, it's the aerobic portion of training is, yes. is kind of boring. And often that portion of the season comes in what most people have is the colder part of their, their season and po colder part of the year traditionally is kind of their, their general base and time to do a lot of aerobic development. Mm -hmm. and what what ends up happening depending on where you live you're almost forced indoors like for for imperial athletes you know once it gets to something in the the 60s or below i'm not a big fan of going outdoors from a from mm -hmm. a bike standpoint cuz to hold another you know, 25 miles an hour, I just feel like I'd rather be other things than a popsicle mm -hmm. and runs. I can like, I've been doing a lot of runs with the dogs out and we've been maybe going below, um, 32 or, or zero degrees Celsius. And I can, I mean, you're not going at that same speed. So it's a little bit more like tolerable in my mind. Yeah. Your hand, but, your hands aren't freezing cause you're going too fast. Right. And we, my wife and I were going somewhere and we saw somebody biking. I think it was like, we were going to our run on Thanksgiving and, uh, we, we looked and there was somebody biking and it was like 28 degrees. And I'm like, I can't help, but just laugh at that individual because they have like, yeah. there's a lot of things that I do where not all my brain cells are connected. <laughs> that is one where I'm just questioning that sanity right there. Well, have you ever seen national lampoons, Christmas vacation classic? So they go out, the, go out in the first scene and they're going to cut down a Christmas tree and their daughter is progressively, or they're all getting progressively colder and colder. And that's just how I imagine like riding a bike outside in, in sub 32 degrees is like, right. yeah, when you first get out there, it's fine. Like, you know, you, maybe you have your, your glasses on or something like that, but like all of a sudden when you get back, like your tongue is frozen, so you can't talk, your eyes are frozen open, so you can't blink or anything like that. And it's just like absolutely miserable. See, now you, you've, you've changed my, like. Now, every time that I see somebody outdoors at that, I'm going to take a look, Audrey. Yeah. She can't. Her eyes are frozen. 
<laughs> oh my gosh yeah that's too funny i used to do uh I, like i know i know you're not a huge fan of of exercising in the cold and when you said 60 degrees i was like oh dude this guy really doesn't like to exercise in the cold but you said okay 32 degrees you know like we'll go running with the dogs i came back during my master's degree for like uh winter break one time it didn't get above 10 degrees outside and i went cross-country skiing every single day and it was one of those I'm things, tapping yeah. out. <laughs> it was one of those things i had a goatee at the time and every time i got done i just looked like the you know like like just a lumberjack who had been you know outside too long just icicles you know just like hanging from my from my goatee like i i just since I've never done cross country skiing, I guess I can't because I don't. I'm sure from a hydro, or I mean, from a thermodynamic standpoint, you are holding a pretty high body temperature. But just the thought of being out longer than walking to the car in that temperature, mm -hmm. no, 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 it's. <clears throat> I always like, cause I mean, you know, growing up in Michigan, I'd regularly run in, you know, six inches of snow and it was like, you know, pretty cold, those sort of things. I would always default to overdressing significantly rather than underdressing, um, you know, and that could get to the point of wearing like, you know, three layers of tights on the bottom and the top. And it, like, so it, it, you know, I, I try to stay toasty. That's like, you know, normally when we talk, I'm wearing like a jacket in here. It's like, it's not even that cold. I have a heater literally right next to me, but still, I would rather be warm than, than cold. Cause you can always shed layers. You can't put layers on if you forget them. But the big thing is, is you don't have to do that if you're indoors. <laughs> exactly. And, <laughs> so back, back to the conversation. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we went off topic a little bit there. How did yeah. that happen? So if you don't like training outdoors in the cold, like Aaron and I don't really like training outdoors in the cold, then you're you're kind of stuck with with some indoor training. And I think, you know, anybody who's tried to, you know, do some some aerobic base building on the treadmill or the stationary bike or if I, I used to be a rower, you know, we we did indoor training on the rower. Holy mackerel, that is boring. Um, it, you, you realize very quickly, you know, it's like, well, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staring at this wall. It's going to be another, you know, hour, hour and a half of trying to build this aerobic base. And it can be really discouraging because actually today was a perfect example of this. I, I've been doing a lot of indoor training and, and generally my training is, is fairly basic. It's like, OK, I'm going to pick a pick a power output that I know is around, like, say, zone two. And I'm going to do that for an hour to an hour and 30 minutes. And most of the time I can get by by like watching YouTube videos or, you know, looking at Instagram or reading papers or doing other things like that. But for some reason today, it's like I would watch, I would feel like I watched like 10 minutes of a YouTube video. And then I'd look back at my computer at my computer and only like two minutes had gone by. And I was like, Oh my gosh. So, you know, so it's one of those days where it's just like the time doesn't, the time doesn't match what my brain is actually thinking in terms of effort and stuff. So um, yeah, Aaron, it, do you, ha what, are, what are your solutions to those sort of things? Because it, if I'm feeling it, I am sure a lot of other people are feeling it too. They're just like, this is so boring. It's so hard to actually get the training in. And you are, you are exactly right. And <clears throat> really to be straightforward, this is predominantly the way that I have trained. So I think that it's allowed me to kind of go through the experience in a large volume that then helps other athletes that I coach and even ones that I might just have conversations with to try to find some form of whether it be tolerance or enjoyment in the environment. And it's, I, I truly enjoy indoor training and when i when i started i ended up like burying myself like while i was riding i just buried myself in some textbooks and some other things to get certifications and other i went through those certifications got the got the scores that i needed to to be certified but mm -hmm. that's a lot of what like i was super mentally receptive i found that to be very very beneficial but 
I've tried a little bit of anything and everything to try to find what stimulates that that process. And I think, sadly, this is where some triathletes and maybe cyclists in general too don't give it enough credence. And then they just start jumping back into the the gray zone training or steady state efforts and spending a vast amount of time there, which is not going to really help them grow in aggressive forms. They're, they're going to get very efficient at holding those paces, but they're not going to grow physiology and, and they're not going to really elevate their ability to gain fitness over the time. So mm-hmm. what what we've spent a lot of time is developing zone two work and below that have segments with them. So there's going to be 10 minutes of focus. Maybe we go another five, but we increase wattage, we decrease cadence because that's going to also kind of turn it more into a neuromuscular recruitment style exercise Mm -hmm. that actually suppresses the heart rate just a little bit even though you're giving a little bit more uh, like output as far as wattage and we go through different segments of of that whether it be 10 15 20 30 40 minutes and then back off for three two maybe even five or ten minutes just depending on what the set might be Mm -hmm. so one in in including some intervals that still fit what the goal is. I think many of us just hear intervals and we think, oh, VO2 max or threshold or steady state. But no, you can do intervals at zone at the top of zone two or just a touch below Mm -hmm. and then change that dynamic up through the course of that effort where maybe you're at the top of zone two, you're at the middle of zone two, you're you're back up at the top, then you drop all the way down. All of these things are going to make you also more efficient at sustaining heart rate through that length of time. Mm-hmm. And you're going to build quality physiology development there. I was going to say to add to that, that is doing something along those lines is going to be much more indicative of what you would be doing truly during race day than what you're actually going to be doing. And I, I don't, I don't know because I haven't raced enough, but I don't think anybody is, You know, like even if you were trying to maintain a constant power output. So, for example, let's say, you know, your Ironman power to be, you know, 200 watts or something like that. Even if that was your aim, there's still undulations and changes in the course. So you have to shift. You have to back off. You have to go a little bit faster. You have to do different things. You're going down a hill so you can rest. You're doing all these different things. And it's not just a constant power output of. 200 watts it's maybe a little bit more neuromuscular in some cases maybe it's a little bit more rest in some cases so um i i think i I think what what i wrote down was the key here to keep yourself entertained at least you know uh from from a biking perspective is variation you you need to vary you know like you you can vary your cadence you can vary your elevation you can vary your uh power um, you can switch from erg mode to resistance mode, depending on, you know, the type of uh, software that you're using. Um, and, and that's where, so I, I, I personally have used full gas just because I have worked with them and they, you know, were nice enough to, to allow me to use their software. And something that I haven't really tried, but it's totally possible is they have, you know, the ability to do resistance mode the entire time. So I could go to Iron the Ironman Kona course and I could go ride that and I could say, okay, well, I'm going to focus on uh, not maintaining a heart rate that's 130 beats per minute or below. And it's going to add that variation, those undulations, the changes in the course for you. And you're going to get a simulation of kind of, you know, a little bit more of what would be indicative on race day than, you know, comparatively to something where it's just like, yep. For example, today I did I did an hour, 190, 195 watts for an hour, and was just like, "Yep, this is pretty miserable." Like, <laughs> <laughs> pretty boring, pretty miserable. So, so you know, so I, I'm learning, and this is this is why I love having these conversations because yeah, I'm like, "Oh, that's such a good idea." Like, why don't I, you know, do like, you know, start at 150 watts, build up to 190, hold it there for a little bit, go back down 
change cadence or something along those lines and like you know do those intervals but do those intervals within my zone two and you know where where the zone two capabilities actually are well it's amazing having led so many rides and like I, i welcome large amounts of questions in these rides and Anytime that I vary cadence or change things up, I get a lot of questions. Oh, why are you putting it here? Why are you doing this? And it's like what I gather from this point is that a lot of people just hop on their trainer, go complete steady and don't deviate from anything. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, that's just to me, that's madness because you're doing the same thing over and over and over again for long, long periods of time. It's very monotonous. So yeah, you need to probably find other things to stimulate your brain. I would much rather we're there for the workout. Mm -hmm. I would much rather stimulate your brain and your body through the workout rather than having to rely on some of these other outside factors. Because as I, as I said earlier, where I was doing studying, early on in this process, one thing that I found though, if, if, if I put a TV show or if I put a movie on, I would come and go out of that TV show or movie. I like, yeah. especially the TV show, I would zone out for 15, 20 minutes. And next thing you know, I like, where am I? Like what, what, what I just missed the plot. So if I had never seen that show before, like I can't binge watch anything mm-hmm. in that, in that arena. Cause I'm not going to get, like, I'm just going to come in, I'm going to go out brain wise, and I'm not going to have a clue of what I watched or what the plot was. Mm-hmm. Same thing with a movie. So it's like, I think I told you earlier, the, the key thing or the one thing that has probably been something that I can put on the TV screen is the tour because you don't necessarily need, like, it's great for me because you don't need to be dialed in from the first part of that telecast to the very final crossing of the finish line, you can come and go. You probably want to be involved, like somewhat engaged by the time that they're getting around the final five or so kilometers. But Mm -hmm. beyond that, it's just like, you can come in and go out and not pay too much attention to it. So I try to build these bike style workouts that, change the narrative change the dv they're just deviation enough to make you think have you engaged in the process because also one topic that we probably haven't even talked about is if you're zoning out through these rides you might not be paying attention to your heart rate you might not be paying attention to some of these things that are going to kind of be your guardrails to getting the the actual goal and benefit from that particular ride Mm -hmm. so being able to be somewhat engaged with the ride as well is also going to allow you to make sure that, oh man, heart rate's starting to go up. I better tick back the bias just a little bit, just to make sure that I maintain where, where that range that I want to be in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I a hundred percent agree with that. I think, you know, there's a healthy level of, of staying focused and staying uh, distracted during this sort of stuff. And it really comes down to what's your what's your goal for the actual workout, and we'll talk about treadmill training a little bit. But for um, for for biking, do you how how do you recommend it to your athletes, especially in the off season or in the in the in the base season, the the preparatory phase? Do you recommend them to to keep heart rate kind of as that like that like guide? You say, okay, we we know your zone two heart rate is generally around one thirty, one thirty five, something like that. Do not go over that. If it is, then you have to start adjusting down. Like, do you use that as a hard cap, or do you typically go by power? So the rides that we designed are are gauged by power but I still want the athletes paying attention to heart rate. So Mm -hmm. the, like most of the time off season, I want to control stress. So I ask my athletes to start utilizing erg a little bit more in this phase, just because it does control kind of the outputs. And I mean, depending on what course you choose in full gas or what course you choose in uh, Swift, you could be faced with a lot of climbing that you might not either be prepared for, or 
it's going to elevate your heart rate to a point where you are working in zone three and we're not, we just don't want to spend time in that zone. Right. So the, the rides are designed based on what we have matched up your zone two heart rate with your wattage to cross over to be in that. But still we want to pay it to, we don't want to completely go oblivious to what the heart rate is. And if we do notice, okay, this is only the second set. I got six of them. My heart rate starting to push up towards the top of that zone two. Mm-hmm. Probably need to start pulling down the bias or this one is either going to be a long day or by the end of this one or by the first part of the third, I'm going to be a little bit more out of control and it's going to be a heck of a lot harder. The deeper that I get into this, higher the heart rate is for me to really control the heart rate and have you get any type of benefits without really dialing back the bias at that point. Yeah, I think I, I think something for people to to recognize too is that if you overshoot something and your heart rate goes too high and you're training by heart rate, say on that given day, it's really, really hard to dial that heart rate back in if you accidentally go too too high. Um, you know, speaking speaking from experience doing this, uh if you know, it, it just takes your body an exponentially longer amount of time to try to come back to homeostasis after you've after you've gone too far. So it's always good to be conservative, especially with, you know, the the zone two recovery rides, volume building rides and those sort of things. The whole point of those is to accumulate volume without accumulating more fatigue than is possible to recover from. So if if that is the goal in knowing the knowing the goal of that session, then then you should be monitoring some level of physiological variable, whether that's heart rate, SMO2, whatever you want to look at. And you should be making sure that it doesn't get to that tipping point. It doesn't get above, you know, that kind of like runaway freight train zone. It's okay to, you know, maybe, maybe dabble into, into zone three a little bit, but like back off. But what I've, another thing I've been thinking a lot about lately is when, when I go from zone two to zone three, and this is in a five zone model, I notice that my heat accumulation is so much higher than if I'm just in zone two. And I'm trying to figure out, I've been talking to uh, Dr. Jacobs offline about this, but I'm trying to figure out if, you know, if we cross over, you know, that, that boundary or that threshold area, are we increasing our heat production because of type two fiber recruitment and because of inefficiencies in type type two fiber recruitment and how much ATP we're actually breaking down. So it's like, it's like, it's an inflection point in heat, uh, in heat, uh, accumulation as well. Um, so if you, and if anyone knows, if you start to accumulate heat too much, you're going to eventually cause changes to proteins, enzymes, other things like that. And then it's again, it's going to be harder for your body to come back uh, to homeostasis. So that was just something I've been thinking about lately is like, you know, if you're really trying to to dial in that, you know, that zone two, if you notice that you're starting to to sweat a lot more than you were at a previous zone and your heart rate's starting to go up a little bit, that might be an indication that like you've, you've reached that uh, heat accumulation area and you might need to back yeah. off a little bit. Well, and I wonder also... <clears throat> Is that also giving you an idea and insight that you're you're burning a lot more carbohydrates at that point too? Yeah, that's what because that's what I'm wondering about is like you know, I I think something that's that's greatly underappreciated but more so appreciated within the triathlon community, especially Ironman community that goes to Kona every year, right? Is the necessity for heat training and getting good at you know managing heat, but if you're I don't know if it's, are you, you know, it's like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Are you, are you breaking down more ATP and that's causing more heat release? And then on top of that, to make up for the ATP, you know, breakdown, you have to, you know, come in with more carbohydrates. So I I think it's, I think it's kind of that. I think what's driving it is the demand of breaking down more ATP, but it's coming from more type two fiber recruitment at that point, which is less efficient, more reliant on than carbohydrate. So it's, it's this, you know, kind of double-edged sword. And, um, I, I think, have you heard of, oh, I, I think his name is a Yogiv. Um, he's a, yes. 
Yeah, he's a he's a PhD. I th- I believe he's in. Well, I know he's in Canada, but I think he's at the University of British Columbia. He works really closely with Jem Arnold, and he said that I can pretty he can pretty much tell when somebody is at their fat max or just above it because they start sweating more. So so now I'm trying to I'm trying to put put my physiological brain my physiology brain into into work, and I've just been thinking about that because man I've been sweating like crazy. And I've, I've, I've almost purposely been working just a little bit harder than where I know my zone two is just to try to maybe move that needle up a little bit. Cause I, I, I view it kind of the same way as second threshold training. You got to train around or above a little bit above that threshold in order to push it up, obviously without accumulating too much fatigue. Um, and right now my body's just been feeling pretty good in terms of being able to, you know, absorb volume and other things like that. But the caveat that I will put with that is <clears throat> this is a good process in shorter bouts. Mm-hmm. You don't necessarily like the way that Phil is talking about it now. If you have a three and a half hour ride or building to a four hour ride, you might not want to be pushing that needle within the first 45 minutes of that ride because yes. that will end up creating a. Ah, challenging finish to to that particular yes. workout. Yeah. So I mean, let, I think it's important to at least state that. Yes, and and to put uh, context to the content that I was just talking about, I only I'm only riding for forty five minutes to an hour at these paces. So I'm not I'm not trying to accumulate upwards of you know two three four hours. So I don't. What I found for myself, and because I am training for slightly shorter distances, is that I can push that a little bit and then still recover on a day-to-day basis, come back, have my heart rate normalize, my SMO2 normalize, and other things like that. So those are the things that I'm paying attention to on a daily basis. And, and you know, so it's, but it's always, it's like, I, I might be pushing it a little bit, right? Um, and, but as long as I'm able to recover... I, I don't think this is gen, you know, this isn't general prescription for everybody, especially those of you who are trying, you know, like Aaron said, to build up to those two and a half, three, four hour rides. Like, d- don't go out too hot. <laughs> Cause, like I said, if you overcook it, it takes way more time to actually renormalize than if you just, you know, stayed below that threshold the entire time. And it's also important to get, some baseline measures from yourself before you start pushing it that way. Because again, if you go in early and start putting it going out too hot and you don't, or you are not sure how you're going to respond, you don't want to spend half of that workout pretty much being a useless workout. And that's what sometimes they are. You, I mean, when you miss the mark, you complete. I mean, there's times where you completely miss the target and you got very, very little benefit from, I mean, I just, if you're going to invest three hours into something, by goodness, you want to get something from it. The last yeah. thing I want an athlete to do is, is me look at this three hour ride that they've done and like, Oh no, man. Uh, Hate to tell you, we didn't get a whole lot accomplished here. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and that's that's why it's important for you as the athlete and the coach to communicate what what the purpose of a workout is. And I think that's always the best way of getting people to understand how to approach a workout. Is you say, okay, well, we we want this workout. Uh, we'll we'll go back to the zone two example. We want this workout to be lower than zone two, or at or below zone two because we're trying to build volume today. When you're building volume, it, it's one of those things where you, it, it's pretty inappropriate to expect to go the same speed and build volume 10% each week. And I've had to talk many runners kind of off that, I, like out of that idea of like, no, we're just building volume right now. If you're feeling tired on a given day, if, if, if you wanna be able to come back tomorrow and do the same exact thing, so you can build more volume, you have to slow down because you're just covering more mileage. You're covering, you're, you have more time on, on the bike. And 
that that is kind of the point, I guess, for the most part of of the preparatory phase, the base phase, is to be able to build that volume and accumulate more volume. So then your body is more resilient to the specific work, the comp, the competition phases when when you get there. But what's going to make you want to do that is making it fun and interesting. Yes, exactly. Full circle. See, thank you for <laughs> thank you for reining me in. Um, no, I know that's a, if anyone listens to this podcast regularly, I think they appreciate the fact that like, you know, we, we start with the best intentions here and then it's like, okay, dive down, 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 down. Okay. Oh, someone realizes, okay, we went too far. Okay. Get back out. Okay. Yeah. Oh, whew, we're treading water again. We came up for air. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think, is there anything else you want to say about making, um, say cycling training, uh, or base cycling training fun? Diversity. I think that that's the, I mean, we've talked about it. That's kind of the foundation. I think that that is the one thing everybody just don't like we through this process of the podcast, we've talked about all different types of, of styles of training, tempo, VO2 max, steady state, tempo. Um, these, you can do the same kind of, process within this area within the workout by not leaving your fenced in area and working within that that area of operation to get the greatest benefit and it can be done through cycling if you have a wahoo climb changing the angle on that or if you don't you can build up blocks to build up the front half of the bike um changing the duration of how high you're at one particular wattage, how high you're at another particular, so that you can be at the top of zone two, middle of zone two, bottom of zone two. You can come back into zone one to make sure that the heart rate is going to stay within that parameter. So when you go back up to the top of zone two, you, you are getting efficient training. So don't, it doesn't necessarily need to be five minutes. It doesn't need to be 15 minutes. It doesn't need to be 13 minutes. It can be a varied number. Mm -hmm and provide some form of just diversity that keeps the brain and keeps you entertained through what is really truly some of the most important work that you do. Mm -hmm. Yep. I a hundred percent agree. So let's, let's move on to then treadmill training, because I think training on the treadmill, again, we have a lot of this. I, I think a lot of people have a lot of uh, similar, ideas and notions about, oh, mm -hmm. I have to get on the treadmill. I have to do steady state on the treadmill. I'm not going to change the incline. I'm not going to do anything like that. I'm just going to run on the treadmill. But before we actually start that, I'll give you a plug for um, Aaron's Saturday morning Zwift rides. He said, I don't know if you mentioned it on the podcast, but you definitely mentioned it beforehand. It's like 230 people. 13. 213 yeah, we were... people on the last ride on Saturday. It starts at 8 p.m. Eastern time every single Saturday that Aaron is available and it's on Zwift and I'll link it in the show notes. Um, it's legitimately sure. there even when I'm not. So it is oh, there okay. every week and we have enough individuals that are there on a routine that even if I'm not there, they'll welcome you into the community and, and treat you like your family. So it's yeah. just, it's Perfect. a legit place to just, and, and I shoot, I think I even had a meeting with two of them that signed up on Endure IQ this week. And they're like, man, I've been on your ride for the last couple of weeks. That time just goes by super, super quick. And I'm like, one of the goals that I have out, yeah. yes, I, that, that's one of those goals that I want to accomplish. So it's, uh, it, everybody thinks that I'm sitting there, uh, talk to texting, but I'm like, no, I don't feel comfortable enough to do it. Everything that I do is typed. <laughs> so I, I'm, just I'm answering questions for long periods of time, but as I, oh, I guess if you're in aero position, you oh, can really, perfect. yeah, you can easily hold your phone. <laughs> That's what I've told people. They'd like, it has taught me to hold the aerodynamic position for ages. Yeah. Just because I'm sitting down there and just firing out texts. So when I go into like actual TT race prep, I'm, I'm okay with the position. I just need to get a little bit more of a tuck, but everything mm -hmm. it's to get down, just hold that position. I can do it for days. 
That's awesome. Yeah, it's beneficial for you too. And I'm sure it makes the time go by a lot faster when you're answering all those questions. I know for me, it, it's for sure beneficial. Oh, there's, I, you know, I'll be completely honest when I say this. There are times when I look up to the computer screen, or the, I have it on my TV, but I look up to the TV screen for the first time and I'm like, ah, we're 20 minutes in. It's like, we're over 65 minutes in. I have no idea. It's like, okay, maybe I should take a drink here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh crap. I, should, I, I need to actually start fueling, you know, it's like talk about being, being, you know, being connected right with the workout. <laughs> well, the good thing is I don't, I don't need to. And a lot of these rides, I try to strategically go somewhat slightly dehydrated mm. just because I feel like sometimes in a race I do get behind from hydration. So if I can kind of provide a little bit of exposure to the muscle structure in a dehydrated state, I can still ask it to do what I want it to. And it actually seems to be pretty beneficial for me. Mm -hmm. So, and I've told you before, I'm not, I'm not taking carbohydrates on these style of rides anyway. Right. So it's more of just getting some water and just electrolytes, but yeah, it, it actually kind of works out even if I don't take a sip for that first structured amount of time, because eh, it's kind of what I'm trying to work on anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, it, it, yeah, that, that is something. And we, we'll talk about that. I, I think in a subsequent podcast is like, how can you introduce, you know, like hormetic stressors, right? You know, slight dehydration, heat, uh, you know, maybe, maybe going fasted into a ride, maybe not, you know, maybe going high carbohydrate into a ride, other things like that, just to see how your body responds. Because on race day, you know, if, if, if you screw something up, you drop a water bottle, you do something like that, or it's too hot or other things, you know, it's like, you got to make sure that your body has at least experienced it before. So then mentally you can, you know, kind of cope with it. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think that that could be a cool topic that we can touch on, but let's touch on the, the, the treadmill. How do, how do you make, how, how do you make the treadmill fun? Because I think people view it as a medieval torture device, even though I can guarantee you it's not as bad as some of those medieval torture devices I've, I've seen in, in, uh, in museums. <laughs> In uh, this is by far the most common, if you want to call it a complaint, I guess it. People hate the treadmill, and I don't. I don't understand it. I think it is a very valuable tool, especially if you're, if it gets dark too early, you don't want to run in the dark. Or like mm -hmm. you want to feel safe. You want to get like it is one of the most valuable tools we have as an endurance it, triathlete and runners. I think it's, it's a marvelous piece of equipment, mm -hmm. but again, very similarly, like to we were talking on the bike where people, they legitimately just get into these zones and I'm going to tick it up to this particular miles per hour. I'm going to have it at this particular percentage of incline and I'm going to go. And I'm going to take off 55 minutes or 75 minutes or 90 minutes. Talk about just, I guess you are watching paint dry in that point. I can <laughs> understand why you dislike it so much. And one of the things that myself and some of the other coaches at Endure IQ, we've taken time to develop treadmill style workouts. And like one of the ones that I had talked to you about, Phil, before we went online was where I have a 15 minute warm up, we're doing. I believe that the treadmill should always be at some form of an elevation because it's just going to give you the proper stress that you would normally see outdoors, whether it be undulation or wind. So I always recommend my athletes to have a one or one and a half percent incline on their treadmill at any given time. But here we're starting at one percent, we're doing a 10 to 15 minute warm up. So nice, comfortable pace, getting comfortable. Once we get the 15, then what I have the athletes start to do is raise that treadmill level up either one level or one or 10% every minute. So it's going up, up, up. When it hits six and you've held that for that minute, then you drop back down to one, you give a two minute warm up, and then you do it all over again. And the thing that I found is I've had a number of athletes that really – and if you ever get me to like the treadmill, something's gone on. I have actually accomplished that task with that particular workout alone, and I use it routinely 
in the off season because one, it's a good chance you're going to be on the treadmill. Two, it's a great strength builder because at certain points we're holding a minute at five percent, six percent. And yes, we are still focused. These are aerobic. So I'm still focused on heart rate over pacing. So you're having to pay attention to, oh, it's been 60 seconds. I got to turn the dial up to move one level up, but I got to make sure that my heart rate is staying. And if you start to see, so the heart rate, as we know, Phil, it takes good two to three minutes for you to get steady state. But we want to start to recognize how quickly the heart rate is raising in the early stages of that. And if you start to see it jumping four or five beats, you need to slow the treadmill down a couple of notches too. So you might go from running at seven miles an hour in the warm up down to maybe even a 6.2 based on the incline perspective on this. And it's just important to provide that attention to this detail and it makes the time go by so much quicker i i I had these things built out to like an hour and nine minutes i want to say and athletes are like man that felt like it was a like an old traditional 30 minute run yeah and when i hear that it's another one of those times where i kind of pat myself on the back because yeah. Hey, I mean, I felt like I, I gave that person some enjoyment. So I did part mm-hmm. of my job there and then they stuck to what the workout was. So I, I checked all my boxes off today. So I feel like adding that same diversity on the treadmill changes everything. And I know I used an example of one minutes, but you could even do it two or four minutes, changing yeah. things up, go up, come down, go up, up, again, go down, down again. And you can just kind of change the dynamic of everything by just changing. I mean, what treadmills don't have the capacity to change elevation, Mm -hmm. probably the assault ones and some of the other ones that are curved, but for most part, most of the treadmills that athletes are going to hop on have the ability to change the elevation or incline, and then you can change the pacing. So it's super, super important to take advantage of both of those to work within the limits that you're trying to accomplish in that particular day. And especially, I mean, I just, it's a great tool. I I use it for sprinting. I use it for endurance work. I use it for all sites, like all types of training. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I like the treadmill and it's, it's very similar to, you know, like a, like a stationary bike, right. Is you get, you get the opportunity to control a fairly chaotic movement a little bit better, right. Running, running is, is, is controlled chaos, you know, at the end of the day. And if you, if you put somebody on a treadmill, you know, you, you give, you get the opportunity to actually control kind of that, that chaos in a sense. Like every time when I go and mm-hmm. run down this hill, it's like, you know, there, there's hardly any steady state running. It's, it's all changes and it's changing based on if it, you know, if there's a little dip in the, in the hill or, or anything like that. Whereas I think like, you know, cycling, you can get a little bit more of that, like true steady state sort of, sort of work, but on a treadmill, you know, you can, you can control all of that, but then on top of it, yeah, using this idea of diversification and variation, you can you can essentially make like simulated, you know, tracks and elevation gain and other things like that. And, and the big thing is, is that you're, you're almost gamifying, you know, kind of, kind of like what's, what Zwift did for, you know, indoor training, you're gamifying the the system and you're making it fun because things are kind of changing. Oh, there's a checkpoint coming up. I gotta, I gotta maybe increase my speed a little bit, but after that I can, I can, you know, rein it in, get my heart rate down, you know, to where, to where it's supposed to be. Um, you know, you might also find that, oh, every time I go above, you know, 4% grade, my heart rate just goes through the roof. It doesn't matter how fast I'm running or how slow I'm running. So I was like, huh, maybe I need to work on my efficiency of, you know, like uphill running, um, a little bit, you know, maybe something's going on that's making me non-efficient when I'm actually, uh, you know, doing that. Um, then you can also start to think about, you know, like, like just, yeah, just, I don't know. It's, it just comes down to, you know, like the, the variation I think keeps you engaged with it and then allows you to, to enjoy it a little bit more. 
Well, and again, before we went on air, we talked about how, I mean, like I'll use them for some gait retraining aspects mm-hmm. as well. So we, we can work on marches, we can work on cadence work, we can work on driving that knee. And anytime that you get tired or you lose that kind of mental focus, hands on the rails, feet go out to the rails, relax, bring it back in. We can do some really, really good gait retraining work on a treadmill because I haven't just told you, go run 30 minutes out. Oh crap, you got to come all 30 minutes back. Mm-hmm. A certain day, one, bad day happens or you, you have some tight calves, you just hop off, go, go get your stuff and go back into the, either up the stairs or go home. But two, mm-hmm. I do feel like we can break down these moments of whether I'm working on an overstrider or whether I'm working on a hip dropper or a glute amnesiac where the, they're not firing. I can change the dynamic of the treadmill, maybe adding a hill to force them to pull their knee forward and really get that good push off on the back foot. Mm -hmm. These are all things that we can actually do on a treadmill that it is very, very hard to say. I mean, you can do it. Don't get me wrong in the outdoor environment. It's just a lot harder to kind of get some of those areas of response from the modality that you're doing. And I think Mm -hmm. that that is just, one of the things that it's great for cadence work. It's just, it, there's a lot of things that you can kind of provide, pay that short amount of attention, jump to the rails, relax, come back on, do your dialed in focus. These are all things that you can kind of utilize to make the indoor training process much more entertaining. Yeah. I, I think too, that that's a really good point because for, I think for most of us, it's, it's a, okay, well, I'm just going to get out there and I'm just going to run, you know, for an hour. And this give, actually gives you an opportunity to, to shift that focus away from, okay, I'm just going to run to, well, you know, exactly like what you, what you were saying, you know, maybe I need to retrain my gait. This is a perfect time. The, 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 the preparatory phase during the, uh, de- I keep calling the off season. It's not the off season because you're actually training during the base phase this is a perfect time to, to retrain your gait so that when you do get to the, the, the points in the season where you're running faster and under more load, you're going to be more effective and more efficient. And this is exactly, we, we've talked about this, you know, a no, number of times is like, you know, yes, by changing your gait, you might become in a, a little bit more inefficient, you know, at, at the very beginning. But if you ingrain that and you put it into your work every single day on the treadmill, because it's, again, it's one of those uh, more controlled environments, then once you actually get out into actually going and doing it, you have the opportunity to then, you know, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road, you know, in a sense. That's the translatability of all of that. And I also want to tell people is like, I like to treat all of my training sessions very similarly. And what I mean by that is, I like to have some level of dynamic warm up in the beginning, whether it's uh, on the bike, I'll do like a little bit of a step test and then I'll do what I call moxie warm up. And then I like to get into my workout, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, intervals, zone two training, whatever it is. And then at the end, I like to do some level of like a cool down as well. So you can also implement that into your indoor aerobic base training. You can have a warm up for your cycling. You can establish a warm up for your running. And for the most part, I mean, you can you can do most of the mov- the dynamic movements that you would do for a running warm up on a treadmill. Obviously, you have to be a little careful with some of like the hops and the skips and stuff like that if you're flailing your legs out, but you you can do a lot you can do a lot of that sort of stuff on the treadmill and you can still continue to maintain that kind of programming of getting that warm up in. And what I've experienced is that the the more I do a warm up, the quicker I actually can warm up. Like my body gets more effective at, you know, getting warmed up. So it's one of those things where this is also an opportunity to practice like your race day warm up, for example. If you get if you have a solid warm up, then and you practice that every single day of base training, every single day of competition specific training, 
once you get to that race, that's going to be, you know, kind of a no brainer. So you're not thinking about it. You're just going through, you're getting your body, your physiology warmed up. And then it's, it's just like a workout. You're just rolling into your workout and then your brain is automatically making that connection, obviously maybe with a little bit more stress. But I think that's another thing that, that I don't think people think about enough is the, the fact that you can actually simulate most of the training things that you're doing. Um, during this indoor training, you don't just have to jump on and just do whatever, you know, workout that you're actually supposed to do for the day. Yeah. And if you are, I mean, let's just say that you're jumping into VO2 max work or threshold work without <laughs> a real true warm up. I'm, I'm going to say that you're not hitting your targets. Yeah. Or you're going to be struggling a lot in the first, uh, yeah. if you can survive, you know, the first, the first few intervals. Right. Um, yeah, I think, I, I think that is a it, we've 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 done a lot in terms of you know helping people. I think you know try to vary their training, diversify your training, give uh, some concrete examples of you know interval training, interval zone two training. That's that's you know that's that's one of the things. And then on the treadmill, same sort of thing. You know, do something where it's like uh, you can increase the the incline, but make sure your heart rate is is kind of being clamped you're not going over that and you know and you can you can also progress all of this sort of stuff too so you can go like you said from one minute of you know one percent two percent three percent four percent back down you could go two minutes two four six eight and then mm -hmm. you could go even longer you might have to you know adjust the speed do those sort of things but it's like you can progress all of these you could so you could technically be doing an interval workout every single day it's just what's the intensity of that interval workout and yes you know by by true definition oh it might not be truly an interval workout but it if, if you if your parameters are zone two is your max and or you know the upper the upper max and then anything within that is is still fair game i think that's you know i, I think that's a really cool way of changing up you know how we actually think about you know doing zone two training or aerobic based training uh, indoor and it, it time will fly a lot quicker than what, especially if you're accustomed to that other style of training. When you start to implement this, life goes by a little bit quicker. So at least the training goes by a little bit quicker, we should say. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'll say, you know, if you're skeptical about this or anything like that, you know, reach out to Aaron and I. Uh, we'd be happy to, you know, give give you a little bit more concrete example of something that you could do based on, you know, what your current fitness level is, or at least I I would be. Um, Aaron's shaking his head. Yes, he would be too. So uh, reach out to me at critical02 on Instagram. Aaron's at try a geyser. Um, you can also find him uh, in DuraIQ uh, is is his you know company that he is is one of the the head coaches for, and then um, you can find him on Zwift. I think it's just. Uh, in Dura IQ is the the thing that the Zwift rides are under. There are Zwift rides are in Dura IQ. You can find okay. me. I think I'm I'm just at Aaron. I think <laughs> just just Aaron. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so uh, I, I just log in. Yeah, just log in. Ask questions. Do the long ride with him. Um, and and yeah, if you guys have any questions, you know, based off of, of what we've talked about on the podcast before or any other questions that come up based on, you know, any of the other podcast episodes that that I've recorded, uh, please let me know. Comment down below if you're on YouTube. Um, and don't forget to leave a five star review if you're enjoying this sort of stuff on on Apple and Spotify. It really helps us out. It really helps get the word out to um, other people and get more eyes on on the podcast. So if you're enjoying this, share it with people, uh, you know, give us a five star review and we'll catch you guys in the next one.